All right, let's talk about mic placement for recording vocals. Hold on, let me grab a prop. All right, we're going to kind of have an informal discussion about microphone placement for recording vocals today. I'm going to use this Neumann mic from my studio as the prop. This is the Neumann U87. So it's a very common vocal microphone that you might see in the studio. And this one can be kind of harsh sometimes. It's actually not one of my favorites for recording vocals, but it is a very well-known vocal mic and it is used in a lot of studios and it is a very nice microphone overall. I mean, there are definitely worse microphones out there. And so before we talk about vocal mic placement, I just want to acknowledge that you have to think about where you're recording. If you can record somewhere that has a little bit better controlled acoustics, then I would do so. A lot of times if people don't have much of a space, like they don't have a sound booth or we, they don't have any kind of treatment in their space, I would recommend actually going into your closet, for example, where you have a whole bunch of clothes. If you can like wedge yourself in there, you know, if you have a whole bunch of clothes in there, it'll absorb a lot of sound and then you won't get a bunch of nasty sounding room reverb from whatever the space is that you're recording in. Oftentimes, if we're recording vocals, we might want something that's kind of a bit more of a dead room. So less of that natural sound bouncing off the wall sound. And that's so that we can kind of control it within our our DAW. So you're going to think about the space that you're in. You also want to think about the microphone you're using. A lot of times we choose the microphone based on the vocalist that we're working with. So if you're asking someone for a vocal mic recommendation for your vocals and the person has never even heard your vocals, then it's going to be really hard for them to recommend a microphone for you. But just kind of as a rule of thumb, you know, these large diaphragm condenser microphones like this one, people use these a lot for studio vocal recording. And that's because they pick up a lot of nice detail in the high end, whereas ribbon microphones tend to be very warm. They don't have as much of the high end usually. And so they don't help vocals cut through the mix as much. And then we have dynamic microphones, which have a little bit more character to them as well. They don't pick up as much of that those high frequencies so depending on what kind of sound you want you might pick a different microphone and if you're in a room that doesn't have good acoustic treatment i would be very careful about picking something like a large diaphragm condenser microphone because this is going to pick up all the detail of that room good and bad right and you might get more of the bad than you want, right? So if you're recording in an acoustic space that is not acoustically treated, it's not like a world-class studio, it's not a vocal booth, it's nothing like that, then what I might actually recommend is something like a dynamic microphone, which also can sound very, very good in your mix, but it's going to be, for one, a lot of them are more affordable, and it's going to be a little more forgiving with the detail in the sound of the room specifically. So actually, let me set this down. A common one for like a dynamic vocal microphone that is actually like a lot, a lot more affordable would be like the SM58, which is what this one is. If you've seen this microphone before, you know, it's like the microphone emoji. Um, that would be great for something like a room that is not acoustically treated. It's going to be much more forgiving than something like a large diaphragm condenser microphone. It might work a lot better for you depending on what your acoustic space is like. And it's also a lot cheaper than this microphone. So when we're picking the microphone, a lot of times we kind of pick a microphone that does the opposite of whatever the vocals are doing, right? So for example, if the vocals tend to be kind of harsh, I'm not going to pick a microphone like this that can be a little bit harsh in the way it picks up the sound because you're just going to augment that harshness and get more of the stuff that you don't want. If someone has a little bit of a harshness in their voice, I might pick something that's going to tame that down a lot more, like a really nice ribbon microphone or even something like the RE20, which is another Another dynamic microphone that we use on vocals all the time or the SM7, which is this microphone that I'm talking into here, it can help mitigate some of that harshness. It's going to be better at mitigating the harshness than something like this. Whereas if someone comes in with a really deep voice where it's very hard to hear sometimes uh, the transients in their voice to hear them articulating different uh, syllables, then what I might do is I might actually choose to put something like this on their voice because it's going to help that high end pop a little bit more. And you know, in that instance, that's what we would want with that voice. So we're going to pick our microphones the way we pick a paintbrush, right? You want to think about what the voice has, what it doesn't have, which way you want to swing the voice. Do you want it to cut through a little bit more than it does? Do you want it to not be as harsh as it is? And we're going to pick our microphones accordingly. I hope that makes sense. 
So oftentimes when we think about placing a vocal microphone, we place it about six to 12 inches from the mouth, right? And one thing to think about in terms of the distance from the singer's mouth is you want to think about if it's closer, you're going to get what's called the proximity effect. You're going to get more of the proximity effect. And what that is, is as you get closer to a microphone, you're going to hear more of the low end. So as I come in closer here to this microphone, you should hear more low end. And as I go farther away, it's going to sound a little bit thinner, a little less low endy. And if I walked across the room and spoke, it would sound very, very high end, uh, very thin. And that's because of the way low frequencies behave, the way microphones pick up sound. We can dig into that more in more detail. If you want, just let me know in the comments below if you want a video on that in more detail. For now, the cliff notes on this is if you want to hear more of the low end of the voice, place it a little bit closer. And if you want to hear a little bit less of that low end, place it a little bit farther away. And you know, another thing to think about in terms of frequency response with the human voice is that depending on your room, a lot of times the rooms that we use that we have, you know, in our homes, in our studios, in our whatever we have in between, uh, the rooms that we have often have room modes that are close to the fundamental frequencies of some human uh singers, depending on what range they're in. So you think about like 300 hertz, 500 hertz, 400 hertz. Those often have, you know, depending on the room that you're in, your room might be uh, fighting you in those frequencies a little bit. So you might find that depending on the room you're in, you might find that a certain room that you're recording in, you're losing those frequencies a lot, for example, and you might have to then try to record elsewhere or adjust the acoustics in your room by getting some treatment or just even by EQing it after the fact, you know? So it's something to think about is, is your room size and shape and where in the room you're recording and how that affects the acoustics of the space and how that affects the sound that then reaches the microphone. All right, so another thing to think about when you're thinking about how to place your microphone, let's say we've already decided our distance for our microphone, you wanna think about position, right? So you might've seen a lot of times microphones like this get placed slightly if you were to draw a line straight out from the, the singer's mouth, you know, straight like parallel to the floor, the microphone's actually often placed a little bit below that and then angled slightly up towards the mouth. So we often place the microphone that way. We also often place the microphone slightly above and angled down towards the singer's mouth. And so depending on how you place it, you're gonna get a slightly different pickup of the person's voice. So this is something that we do think about consciously as engineers. So the way I was taught to think about this is we have a few different spots where our voice resonates, right? So we have the nasal area where your voice resonates. We have the throat where your actual vocal cords are. And that's what's actually vibrating, right? And then we have our chest resonance. So that's three different spots. Hmm, I almost touched my chin. That's three different spots where our voice resonates. All right. Hi, it's Editing Kato here. I'm just going to throw in a few uh, additions to this video just to help make things a little more clear and be a little more articulate here. So when we're talking about these three different areas, I'm kind of lumping together the nasal area and the mouth here. And I do talk about this a little bit later, but I just wanted to be super clear about it. Uh, you could also think about those as two different areas where the sound is resonating, right? There's the sound that resonates in your mouth, and then there's also the sound that's resonating in the nasal uh, passages. So you could say that there are four areas here if you wanted to. It just depends on how you're thinking about it and how you, how, how much detail you want to get into. Okay, back to the video. So depending on where you place the microphone, right, you're going to get a slightly different balance of those three things. So for example, if you have your microphone a little more angled towards the person's throat or chest, then you might get more of that low end resonance. Whereas if you have it pointed a little bit more towards or coming from an angle that's closer to the nasal area, then you might get a little bit more of that grit and that nasaliness. And so you're going to want to place your microphone based on the type of sound you want. And similarly to how we decide our microphone, we often pick the opposite of whatever the vocalist has, right? If you have a vocalist that has a very nasally voice, then you might not want to place it up here angled down. You might want to do the opposite, right? So oftentimes we're balancing things with our microphone choice, but also our microphone placement choice. And keep in mind that the angle and the location are two independent parameters here. There's whether you place it high, closer to the nasal passages and mouth, or low and closer to the chest. And then there's also the angle at which you place it. Both can control the sound independently, right? So for example, you can place the mic above someone and if you angle it down enough towards the chest more, that might also help cut nasaliness because you adjusted the angle to help alleviate the nasal qualities. And that might help alleviate nasaliness or grit in a similar way 
way to how moving the location down towards the chest may help. It's the combo of the two parameters that really affects the sound. So experiment with it yourself to get an idea of how things tend to sound. And one thing I like to do is I like to set up the microphone. You kind of guess based on your understanding of the singer and their voice and what they sound like. You place the microphone and then you have them sing a little bit and you can have them sing a little bit of the song that you're working on. That's a great way to do it. You can also have them sing like an awe, like a Ah, uh, right. And the ah is great because it helps you hear, for example, if they're too nasally, that's a really great uh, vowel, a really great phoneme for getting whether or not it's a little too much in one direction or the other. So I would recommend maybe doing both of those things. And then if you want to, depending on what you're hearing in the DAW, you can adjust the microphone placement accordingly. So if you're not getting, if you have the microphone placed, for example, slightly below and angled up like we were talking about, and you're not getting enough grit or punch through in the sound, if you're not getting enough of that edge to it, right, enough of that cut, then you might want to shift it to being slightly above and angled down. Whereas maybe you have the microphone placed slightly above and angled down, and you're like, let's try that. That looks like fun. I've seen a lot of people do that in studios. It seems like a good way to place the microphone professionally, right? You might try that and maybe it sounds a little too harsh or a little too nasally or it has a little too much of that grit or that edge to it, then you might want to try swapping it and placing it slightly below and angling up. Okay, and I think this might be the last editing Kato interruption here. I just wanted to add some context to these two examples that I just gave. So I'm using these examples because I was taught to, and I still do, use a starting point for vocal mic placement that's around six to 12 inches away from the singer. And, and this is key, has a small angle, either slightly up or down. So these examples make the most sense when you consider the context of a very small or slight starting angle. And also when they're not that far off from being at the height of the mouth. Okay, back to the video. So how we place the microphone is not, you know, flip a coin and decide what looks the best or like what we feel like doing that day. It's often based on how the singer sounds and how the microphone interacts with the singer's voice in that position. Another good thing is to think about like how when we place the microphone, the singer actually responds to that placement, right? If you place it above, they're more likely to be kind of like reaching up with their body, right? They're more likely to have that body position. Whereas if they're down, they're more likely to have maybe their shoulders down and a little more relaxed. So if you want a little bit more of a relaxed performance, this might help get you like a little bit closer to that relaxed performance. So that's something to think about too, is, is how the singer actually responds to that mic placement. And it's good to keep in mind that, you know, the difference between this placement and that placement isn't gonna be a super huge, super drastic difference to you, especially at first, if you're still learning how to hear those things. You know, as audio engineers, we spend years developing our ears and reinforcing those pathways in our brain for like what we hear versus how we process what we hear. And so it might not seem like a big difference to you at first, but if you start trying to hear that difference, it'll become more obvious to you over time. And you'll notice, you know, like placing it down here, it's not like we don't get any of that, like it's like the harshness or the grit or the cut through, you know, you still get some that, that bounces down, especially like the, the harshness that the high frequencies and the cut through and the transients that like bounce off the top of the person's mouth and then come back down, that does happen, right? Because you have your vocal cords vibrating in your neck and it's making sound and that comes up and it bounces off the roof of your mouth. It bounces around in your nasal cavity. You have some sound that bounces around in your chest. It's all happening at once. And so things will be going in different directions. So it's not like, I'm not saying if you place it down below here that you're not gonna get any of that harshness and it's gonna be like some miracle cure for harshness, right? We add layers of different things to help swing the sound in one direction or another. It's like adding layers of paint, right? You pick your microphone, you pick the distance, you pick the placement, you know, you pick the position, you add your EQs, your compressors, everything sculpts the sound a little bit. And so the more conscious you are about how it sculpts the sound, the closer you're gonna get it to where you want it to be. So that's just something to think about. So yeah, I think that might be just about everything that I wanted to cover for this video on mic placement for recording vocals. You know, at first you might just wanna think about whether or not you have enough acoustic treatment in the room you're in and whether to move to a different space. And then you might wanna think about, you know, uh, what microphone should I use based on this person's voice? Maybe it's your voice, right? What microphone do I want to use for this voice? And then you're going to think about distance. Do I want more low frequencies or do I want fewer low frequencies? Do I want to have more of that grit and cut through or do I want to have a little bit more of that low resonance to it? You know, place it accordingly. And then you know how you angle it. Angling it can have a big impact, right? So if you angle it down a little bit more towards like the chest and the throat, you get more of that power, more of that low end. If you want a little bit more of that cut, a little bit more of that 
that bite and that cut through, you can angle it up more towards like the nasal passage and the mouth, right? If you want a little bit more of those upper frequencies and a little bit more of that edge to the sound. So how you angle it, whether it's down here or up here or, you know, elsewhere can have a really big impact. So all that's to say that how you place a microphone can be a very, very, very detailed thing, or you can just put a mic up and, and see how it goes, right? So explore that, have fun with that, play with that. It should be fun and it should be rewarding. And the more you do it, the more confidence you'll get about it and the more conscious you can be about your decisions and, and how they're affecting the sound. So I think that's about it for what I wanted to cover in this video. I am going to grab a pop filter really quick to show you a pop filter. I'm sure most of you have seen a pop filter before and are aware of pop filters, but just in case, I'm going to grab one. Hold on one second. Okay, so I actually grabbed two because I have two different types here. But basically, if you haven't seen a pop filter before, this is what a pop filter looks like. And it has like a bendy neck, so to speak. And then this part is placed in front of your microphone. This part clips to the mic stand. And basically the purpose of the pop filter is to is to filter out the pops, right? The puh, tuh, like the harsh aspirated phonemes or plosives, if you've heard the term plosives before. And so this is a metal one. So it has a bunch of tiny little holes in it. And basically what it's doing is it's catching those wind bursts when I make those sounds like a puh sound. And its whole purpose in life is to disperse that so it doesn't hit the microphone as hard. So we often have this type Another type that you might commonly see in the studio is the type that looks kind of like pantyhose. So that's what this one is. If you'll notice, it's got like a pantyhose material here. It's got two layers of it. It's, it's I mean, it looks exactly like pantyhose stretched across a frame. Um, I've actually used pantyhose before for this when I was a, a broke student, but same idea, right? You place it in front of your microphone and you can place it super close to the mic. You can place it kind of far away. I actually use this for its own purpose, right? But also to help control how close an artist gets to the mic based on the sound that we want. So instead of having to communicate with them and then rely on them to be consistently at that distance, if I want them to be a little farther from the mic, for example, I might put the pop filter a little bit farther from the microphone. And if I wanna let them get close, I might put it really close. And then, you know, oftentimes I communicate with them as well because it's good to communicate in the studio, but this kind of helps them not have to think about it as consciously, right? It's like, just go up towards the pop filter and you'll be good. Those are pop filters. I recommend using those with vocals all the time. It doesn't hurt. And yeah, that's all I have for you today. Hopefully this made some sense and wasn't too disjointed. Let me know in the comments below what you think. As always, please like, comment, hit the notification bell, subscribe to this channel. Anything helps with channels like mine where it's a little more educational and nerdy and a little less sales oriented. So please hit that subscribe button. Tell any friends that are into audio engineering and music production about my channel. My name's Kato Zane. And please feel free to check out my Patreon. So it's patreon.com slash Kato Noise. My patrons get access to additional content. We have a Discord server we're hanging out on. We're doing a book club on the Discord server. It's been a lot of fun. And other than that, I come out with new videos every Wednesday. And thank you so much for hanging out. Okay. My GoPro died halfway through that. So I hope I got everything in that I wanted to get in. Um, I have a really old GoPro. It's a, a GoPro Hero 7. And it tends to die if I record for too long. And this is the fourth video that I recorded today. I've been doing a bunch for the month because I'm going to be super booked for the rest of the month and I don't think I'll have time to film. So I kind of just filmed them all at once. And when I do that, it has to go for like more than an, an hour sometimes and it doesn't tend to make it. So I had to stop halfway through filming that. But that's just, you know, part of having an old camera, I guess. I might get a new one at some point. So if anyone has any recommendations, anyone like a camera nerd, I would appreciate recommendations. But I don't know. I don't know what I can get, so we'll see what happens. I might just keep working with this, and usually it's okay. Okay. Bye.